thank you all. Welcome all to this webinar. Thank you for showing such interest in this. We have around 280 people registered to join us today, which is a huge number. Um, particular welcome and thanks to our panelists who are all here, who we are all here to listen to. And thanks also to our organizing team that have made this possible. Before I go any further, I have to remind everyone here that the event is being recorded and will be made available on the IEEP website. We will circulate a link to participants when it is uploaded. Um, so you can hear the conversation that we have today back again. My name is Ben Allen. I'm the head of agriculture and land management and the biodiversity teams at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. And I've been given the pleasure of taking us through this discussion today. I aim to keep my voice relatively limited. We've got a fantastic lineup of experts from both sides of the Atlantic. I want to make sure we've got the space for them to share their experience with us today and talk about how the EU and Canada can learn from one another in terms of um, agriculture and improving the sustainability of the agriculture sector. This event is part of a series organized by the Mission of Canada to the EU, a series that's focused on common global green policy priorities, given the importance of environment and climate issues on both the Canadian and EU agendas, including in particular um, those as part of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the previous event that we were jointly involved in was around global biodiversity conservation and COVID-19, building back better with nature. The focus of this webinar, one that um, has gathered quite a lot of interest, is on the agriculture sector specifically. It's a key economic and environmental sector in both geographies, and one which really highlights the shared ambition and commitment of the EU and Canada to rural areas. Before we move into the panel discussion itself, I'd like to take this opportunity and give the floor to Chris Forbes, who's the Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, to give us some introductory remarks and set the scene for our discussions today. Chris, please, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're loud and clear. Perfect, okay. Thanks uh, for that, and thanks to you and the organizers for putting this together. I am really happy to be with you uh, today. I mean, first off, um, let me tell you that I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation uh, in Ottawa. Um, and I also just want to start off by hoping that uh, and wishing that everybody is uh, staying health and safe in this uh, very, very unusual times. I know on both sides of the Atlantic, we are struggling uh, to deal with the COVID-19 virus. And while it's been difficult, I'm really pleased that we're, we're able to connect this way. And we, we have you know, a great event today with, I think, some great participants, policymakers from my department and, and from DG Agri. Uh, some academ academic representatives, as well as two farmers who I am I'm sure will demonstrate for us that the future of farming in, in, in both Canada and in the European Union is in good hands. And I thank all of those uh, who are here to listen today to this uh, important uh, conversation. First and foremost, let me say that, uh, you know, the agriculture sector in Canada, and I think the government of Canada appreciate the leadership the EU is showing in setting out a detailed and ambitious farm to fork strategy. Just last week, in fact, I had a call with uh, the Director General uh, Bircher uh, of DG Agri and we, we talked about some of the issues that you'll cover today, climate, biodiversity and sustainability objectives of the agriculture and food sectors in both Canada and the EU and I, I think we have a lot in common, uh, and, and I think it came through when we talked about the farm to fork strategy, which I think echoes many of the priorities that we see in Canada through our food policy, which we released in June of last year, um, but also uh, through uh, our broader uh, efforts on climate change and improving sustainability. You know, our food policy will, will address issues like food insecurity, access to healthy, nutritious food, reducing food loss and waste, and, and more broadly promoting, promoting sustainable food practices. And those sustainable food practices will certainly be coherent with the ambitious environmental targets that the government of Canada has set. We have a commitment to protecting a quarter, one quarter of Canada's land and a quarter of our oceans by 2025 and using nature-based solutions to fight climate change. Uh, for example, by planting 2 billion trees. The government's also announced that it will bring forward a more detailed plan to even exceed our 2030 climate goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30% below 2005 levels uh, by 2030. 
and also to legislate our goal of net zero emissions by 2050. We've committed to creating a Canada Water Agency uh, that will work together uh, with government, Indigenous communities, and others to find the best ways to keep our water resources safe, clean, and well-managed. And certainly as part of all these efforts, the government explicitly recognizes, as I think all of you today do, that farmers and ranchers are key partners uh, in the fight against climate change. And certainly we will support their efforts to reduce emissions and also build resilience and adapt to a change in climate. In Canada, we've invested uh, more than $100 million to support agricultural science and research and innovation since 2016 with a focus, a real focus on climate change and soil and water conservation. We have a $3 billion uh, partnership with our provincial and territorial partners called the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Confusingly, I suppose for EU friends, that's CAP is the acronym we use. And I'm, I'm sorry for adding that confusion, but ours is uh, the Canadian version. Uh, out of that partnership, $436 million uh, covers environment and climate change programs that are there to help farmers capitalize on opportunities for sustainable growth through things like adopting precision agriculture technology and practices um, and uh, you know, make more effort to store carbon in the soil. But I should note that Canadian farmers, particularly in the prairies, have, have done a lot over the past 20 years uh, to increase carbon storage, uh, most notably by switching to no-till or conservation tillage seeding techniques. And when you combine that kind of practice uh, with a major reduction in summer fowl and, and improved crop rotations, we've seen Canadian, Canada's agricultural soils become a significant carbon sink since 2000. This has obviously, as many of you know, co-benefits for soil health, erosion control, and, and, and water conservation. Uh, we are also, at the Government of Canada, working with partners to invest in science uh, and programming that contributes to improved biodiversity and management of agricultural lands. You know, our ag agricultural landscapes, when you know, we think of grasslands in particular, provide important ecological goods and services uh, that protect water and air quality in addition to protecting the soil and, and obviously are important for animal and plant biodiversity. And we must, as we always do in Canada, work closely with provinces and territories to support the adoption of beneficial management practices to continuously improve the environmental performance of the sector. Maybe quick, turn quickly to food waste, uh, which, as I mentioned, was an important uh, part of our food policy uh, that we announced last year, and also uh, obviously uh, a contributor to uh, GHG emissions that I think around the world we need to tackle. Last week, my minister launched the first two streams of our food waste reduction challenge. Um, you know, this is a challenge type program that's trying to bring new innovators and novel solutions to reduce food waste across the Canadian supply chain. Uh, you know, this will complement other work we're doing uh, to explore the potential of circular economy approaches being applied to agriculture, you know, to re reduce input use and conserve resources, but also to find uh, ways to take waste out of the system and create new economic opportunities uh, for the sector and, uh, and for the unused food products. We've recently invested in an agri-food sustainability initiative, uh, which will help producers meet sustainability standards in the global food market system and show our customers what we're doing on sustainability. This is a really exciting initiative uh, in my mind because for the first time, It'll provide a single window for data on the sustainability of our agri-food supply chain and will support transparency and build trust among our consumers in Canada, but also obviously consumers in our trading partners, which is, which is really important to us, obviously, as an export-oriented country. It's important to remember that there are different paths, I think, to sustainability, and, and DG Bircher and I talked about this last week, and, and certainly we need to work together to engage stakeholders to ensure our efforts make sense to the people implicated, and, and probably no one is more implicated than our, our farmers and ranchers, which I think is, you know, it's great today to have two farmer representatives uh, with us, as I think the future, as my minister often reminds me the future of the agriculture sector is, is in the hands of people like uh, Alicia and, and Andrea who are here today. You know, the efforts we as governments uh, can do to help them is, is, you know, they must be based, I think, on, on science, on good science and, and working together internationally as much as possible uh, to, to inform our policy decision-making, how we set the frame for, uh, for farmers and ranchers to make 
make good decisions and support their livelihood. And while we all we all need to take that into mind and certainly think about sustainable development, we also want to make sure our efforts don't stifle innovation. They should be promoting innovation, as I talked about with the food waste challenge. We want to try to avoid uh, creating too much uh, red tape, and and we certainly want to make sure that movement of food, which has been so critical over the last eight months, as we all know, um, I think uh, continues because we will need that. I think I'm convinced to to continue to feed feed the globe. And that's that's not just a Canadian issue that, that goes well beyond our borders, obviously. Maybe I'll just turn quickly to set a, a, to close up because I think it's a, it's a monumental achievement from our perspective. And I, I think it's been mutually beneficial uh, for both uh, both Canada and the EU and, and certainly for our agriculture sectors. And, and we've seen a rise in, in trade uh, in ag and ag food products going both ways across the Atlantic. I think it represents a joint commitment uh, to the highest environmental and food safety standards, um, which I think for both of us is, is important and something that I'm not sure the EU has in, in agreements with, with many of its other trading partners. And so I think we, we have to find ways as we, as we move forward on our environment and sustainability strategies, farm to fork uh, in the EU and the food policy and, and climate change commitments and others in Canada, we, we need to make sure we preserve the free trade commitments that we've made, um, that supply chains still function, um, and that we have the economic opportunities uh, that I think our producers on both sides uh, of the Atlantic are looking, uh, are looking for. So look forward to working closely with the EU and, and stakeholders as, as they develop the initiatives that will implement the, the farm to fork strategy. And I think, you know, events like this to me uh, are really important. I think sharing information, a better understanding uh, of what's happening on the ground uh, can only help us, right? Um, I think uh, knowledge is, a, is a, great, a great tool for all of us. And I think a, a productive and an interesting discussion today can only help us advance uh, collaboration uh, to our mutual benefit. So Ben, I'll stop there and, and turn it back to you, but thanks so very much for the time. And again, my great appreciation to those who put this event together. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. I think that gives us a really good frame for our for our session today. Um, I know you have to leave before the discussion ends, but I hope some of the exchanges we have will be will be inspiring for you as well. For me, a key element of of what you've just said coming out clearly is that one of cooperation: provinces and territories, member states and regions, farmers, researchers, society in general. And that's a key theme that we're going to be touching on as we go through with our panelists. How can the EU and Canada learn from one another in taking forward our agriculture sectors? We now move into our panel discussion and I'll introduce our speakers in turn as we move through the session. I will ask them now to forgive my pronunciation of their names. Um, we have policymakers to start with. We move to farmer representatives and finally we move to researchers, three key components of improving the way our agriculture functions and works in practice. Just for the sake of our audience, this is essentially going to be an observed conversation between me and between our panelists. Um, given the timing, we're not opening the floor for verbal interactions with the audience. Um, we would love to, we would love to spend the time and do that. We just unfortunately don't have the time. But we do encourage you to post any questions into the chat function here, and we'll see either whether we can answer them as we go along. Otherwise, because our time is short, I would encourage also our panelists as well to feel free to interact with the audience in the chat. If you want to make a response to them or there's a particular question you want to pick up in the chat and do so in a written form, please feel free to do so. Um, hopefully we can get some two-way discussion going there. Uh, but for now, we'll be going through with our panelists, asking them a series of questions and exploring a bit this idea about how EU and Canada can learn together. So our first panelist is Andrian Leisure, who's the Deputy Director, Environmental Policy Division, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in the Canadian government. Andrian, the EU and Canada are both striving for more sustainable agriculture sectors that address climate change and are resilient to it. We've just heard from, from the Deputy Minister there about that. The EU has set its ambitions out in the Farm to Fork strategy, and I'm interested in understanding what Canada's objectives 
uh, and its approach in this respect. Sure, thank you, Ben. So as the Deputy Minister already mentioned, uh, we have a few uh, actually rather similar uh, policy directions uh, to, to the farm to fork strategy. For example, the food policy that was launched last year uh, that really takes a more comprehensive approach to, uh, to our, uh, and it's really a roadmap for a healthier and more sustainable food system in Canada. So we're looking at the social, health, environmental, and economic components of food systems because they are interdependent, but you know, there's often a, ten a tendency to address them in isolation. So we're looking at uh, using those more coordinated and coherent approaches uh, to tackle complex food issues. So I think that's, very, uh, that's a very similar approach to what the EU is doing. In terms of specific objectives, um, the deputy mentioned uh, a few of those, but I'll just uh, repeat them for now, where the, the government has committed to uh, exceeding uh, the commitment to reduce GHG emissions by 30% below 20, uh, 25, uh, 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, uh, last week, the government recently uh, tabled the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, which is going to legally bind the government to a process to achieve net zero uh, carbon by 2050, uh, along with the whole reporting uh, process uh, established to, to make sure that we achieve those targets. Um, there's different commitments uh, related to the protection of uh, a quarter of Canada's lands and, and oceans by 2025 and then 30% by 2030 of the lands and, and oceans. And uh, commitments also around uh, the use of nature-based climate solutions to fight uh, climate change, including by planting 2 billion trees, but also taking uh, into, into consideration the, the power of ecosystems to help us, uh, to, to help us fight climate change. So these are a few of the commitments that the government has taken in terms of the look more specifically on climate change. And there is a, a recognition that all sectors have a role to, to play and that the agricultural sector is doing its part. So for example, um, uh, over the last 20 years, the GHG emissions uh, intensity has reduced by close to 50% in Canada. Um, we, we are one of the few countries in the world with uh, stable agricultural emissions combined with a net positive carbon sink in soil. As, um, as was mentioned, our soils, especially in the prairies, given the, the tillage practices or the no tillage practices, are sequestering um, more than six megatons of carbon uh, every year, or at least in, in 2018. And that, that compensates uh, around 10% um, of the uh, GHG emissions of the agricultural sector. So we're, we're building from a very solid basis. Uh, and there's already lots of uh, efforts being uh, taking place in, in Canada. So more specific, and then the, the, the deputy minister also mentioned the, uh, the, the work that we're doing collaboratively uh, with, the, um, with provinces and territories. They also have their own uh, targets related to climate change or to other environmental issues. So we have, and that really reflects the, the I, I think something to keep in mind is we, need, we have a very diverse uh, set of agricultural systems across Canada. We have much smaller uh, farms in, uh, in the Atlantic provinces, for example, uh, and, and we need to recognize that uh, these regional differences in the, in the regional priorities and, uh, and work together uh, with the provinces and territories and with the sector, of course, to, uh, to achieve those uh, ambitious objectives. So, um, yeah, and then I just wanted to mention also that, as was mentioned, of course, Canada is a, is a country, it's a very large country. Uh, we are mostly, comp you know, our agricultural sector is mostly composed of family farms, but then of course, the, 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 the scale of those farms might be a bit different from, uh, from the scale of farms in, in Europe. Um, but there is a real desire from the producers and the farmers to conserve the, net, the, the resources, conserve, protect the water, uh, to make sure that, um, that they can transfer that to their, uh, to their children or to, to the next generation. And at the same time, being such a vast country with a relatively low population density, we are, of course, very export oriented, which means that we're also really responsive to uh, consumer demands. And we see, um, we see that this, the, the, the sector is also very agile in responding to those consumer demands and uh, making sure that they are improving their sustainability, building from, from the strong basis that we have to respond to, to those uh, more ambitious uh, and more 
so higher uh, demands for sustainability from, from consumers in Canada and around the world. So I think, as I said, these are the, the, the broad objectives in Canada. This is the, and our vision is really to help the sector Cons, you know, become a world leader in sustainability and build it on its advantages and the good work uh, done so far. Brilliant, thanks, thanks, Sandra. You've already mentioned the the, the size and scale difference. Um, you know, whilst whilst we have many shared values between the EU and Canada um, on the global stage um, and approaches, they are two quite different geographies. And uh, we talked about the quarter of a land and oceans. That's a huge amount of land in the, in the Canadian context. Uh, Europe's a big place, Canada is, is, is a lot bigger. What do you think the EU can learn from the Canadian experience? Um, you know, and what also do you think Canada can learn from the EU in, in a very different way? So maybe just to, to talk a bit about the, the similarities, I think, as I mentioned, there's a real de desire to improve sustainability. There's a real desire of our family farmers in Europe and in Canada to, to conserve resources, to protect water, nature, and to be able to transfer uh, their, their assets to, uh, and their resources to, to future generations. And as you were saying, it's potentially just at a different scale. Um, I think uh, the, the less the, the the ways the two uh, so Canada could learn from the uh, from the EU and, and the EU could learn from Canada. Um, I think there's a so from in Canada we're we we are a relatively young country I would say, and I think there's a, there's something to be learned uh, from the EU through the the value added that comes with the the long traditions the long the the long established reputations uh, of several products in the EU. Uh, of course, the flip side of the large export-oriented country is that, uh, and also the, the low population density in, in some of the uh, agricultural uh, regions, is that uh, value added is not as developed as uh, in other regions of the world. And, and that's something that, that I think we could learn a lot from the EU in that respect. Um, and that also, of course, being said in the context of, you know, Canada can build uh, on a strong reputation for quality, for safety, and for sustainability, but there are definitely opportunities to develop value added further. I think uh, an area where we can see uh, quite a bit of interest actually from, uh, from the EU to learn from Canada is a relatively new uh, approach that we're using in Canada, the living laboratories. It's been presented at uh, several international gatherings, inclu including the G20, and uh, it has generated significant interest so far. So basically the idea is to have, um, so to learn with producers, to co-develop solutions to persistent environmental issues, uh, and then use the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning and, uh, and social relations to support adoption of those beneficial management practices in the working landscape. Because what we know is that we invest a lot in research, but then there's differences uh, between you know, the results that you can have and the way BMP, beneficial management practices are gonna be established on an experimental parcel and the way it would work and interact with the, the real co uh, working conditions in, um, in the in the working landscape on farms, so we find that this approach is uh, is very promising, and uh, there's actually a memorandum of understanding between uh, France, the Institut National de Recherche pour l'Agriculture, l'Alimentation et l'Environnement, and uh, this uh, the the Living Laboratory uh, approach guides the development of a European wide program on agroecology living labs by the European Commission. So, so I think that's a way where, where Canada can show, you know, our new approaches, because as you were saying, you know, the, the, the scale and, and the nature in Canada is, is quite impressive. So looking at, for example, carbon sequestration on, uh, on, on agricultural lands for us means a lot because the scale is so wide that, you know, embracing nature-based climate solutions could really make a huge difference in terms of the environmental performance of the sector. So I think this is an interesting perspective to compare different approaches and learn from each other in terms of uh, ways to work with producers uh, to achieve those, uh, those uh, sustainability goals that we have uh, in common. And we are really eager to, to share the lessons learned of our experiences so far, but also learning from, uh, from experiences in other countries as uh, these approaches get implemented. Perfect. Thank you, Andrian, and, and thank you for, for keeping almost precisely to time. That was perfect. Um, we may come back because I think there's, there's areas there that, that we'd like to explore. You mentioned agroecology. We'll hear a bit later from, from Nick around agroecology um, and the lighthouses, uh, sorry, the living labs um, that you mentioned. We have a similar 
a thing in Europe under Horizon Europe, the research framework program around lighthouses. So we might hear from some of our, our other researchers later on, on that point. Um, uh, yeah, I promised myself I wouldn't try and interact too much. I get carried away. I'll move to our, our second panelist, a name I've been dreading to pronounce, um, Heis Hildhaus, uh, who's the head of unit on policy perspectives from DG Agri, from the European Commission. Um, welcome, Heis, to the, to the panel and the discussion. We've just heard from, from Andrian about how Canada, Canada is approaching sustainability, about, um, about how they're taking that forwards and, and ideas that they have about learning from the EU and, uh, and also sharing ideas with the EU. In the context of, of European agriculture, what are the two or three things that EU farmers are going to have to do differently to deliver the ambitions of the farm to fork strategy going forwards? Yes, uh, th thank you, Ben, and uh, th thank you, uh, first of all, for the organizers uh, and for the initiative. Uh, very, uh, very interesting uh, to hear this dialogue. I was thinking we speak the same language, not only in terms of the English, but also in terms of the words and terms we use. Uh, listening to uh, Deputy Minister Forbes, I, I, um, I, I first had the impression I was in an EU meeting because I heard a lot of the priorities that we also have in our in our um, strategy, and uh, and that indeed uh, shows that this is highly useful because uh, it means that there is plenty of scope to to learn for, from each uh, from each other and to uh, uh, to further deepen this uh, this understanding. So you ask a very specific question, so I'll answer very specifically, and I'll try to broaden it a little bit. So if there the two or three things that farmers, in our view, should do differently, I don't necessarily like the, the should, but it's it's more that we want to accompany farmers to towards uh, uh, sustainable farming uh, farming systems. And, and one of the things, for example, is related to biodiversity. We very much want to encourage farmers to um, increase the, the landscape uh, features uh, on farms because that is a very good proxy for improving biodiversity. So that is one of the targets of the common agricultural policy for the next period. Uh, another uh, element is on cropping systems. Um, the word soil has already been mentioned several times, but of course, soil is absolutely key. Uh, so one of the things we want to encourage farmers to do is to make sure there is good crop rotation, uh, that there is a good mix of crops. Nitrogen fixing crops are obviously very important um, and more diversity, uh, diversity in general. Uh, so also that is one of the uh, issues that through our agricultural policy, we really like to encourage. And you ask for three, so I'll mention another one. Uh, precision farming, uh, something we may also want to discuss uh, more during this uh, uh, seminar. Um, uh, precision farming is, of course, also um, absolutely uh, uh, essential because it allows using most modern technologies, digital technologies, to really uh, try to reduce uh, the inputs that are necess necessary while maintaining um, uh, maintaining productivity. And I think you can think uh, of drones, for example, but also of uh, technologies measuring inputs. Uh, one of the one of the things that we are encouraging farmers um, uh, to do, and that we in fact have proposed as a condition for for the, the the direct subsidies that the European Union grants farmers, is is to have a system for measuring their nutrient cycle in their farm. I mean, many farmers who already have done uh, have such a system. There's also many uh, companies uh, and, and private organisations that offer these services to farmers. Um, so we want to complement that in a way by by making sure that all farmers uh, do this, uh, at, because when you measure, you can then take the next step. You can take the next step to improve uh, your your footprint, your sustainability performance. So all these all these elements, and now I'm going to zoom out a little bit, and I hope that I stay within the time you've allotted to me. But all these elements are part of our our, our, our common agricultural policy. Uh, which is being reformed, uh, which is a, a long-standing policy uh, started in 1958. It's being reformed, and really, it's increasingly being integrated with the overall uh, policies of the European Union on food, on health, on uh, uh, on the environment, and on climate. Um, and uh, this this vision is articulated in our Farm to Fork strategy, which you already mentioned. Uh, so this is the, the the paper that the European Commission published um, uh, earlier this year. Which really lays out this vision of a of a food system approach to agriculture and food, an integrated approach, and it tackles uh, issues like I've mentioned, but also, for example, use of antibiotics, reduction of use of pesticides, reducing nutrient losses, biodiversity, like I mentioned, also 
organic farming, one of the most debated topics. Yeah? We, we've proposed to move in 10 years time to 25% organic farming in Europe, um, but also an aspect like broadband access in rural areas, because you can only do precision farming, you can only have economic activity in the rural areas when you have good internet access, like we are experiencing today with this Zoom uh, event. So th these are all aspects that are um, that are the, the key sort of targets of our farm to fork strategy. Uh, eh? But uh, uh, like I said, if you want to focus on what we want farmers to do, then it, it comes down to how we're changing our agricultural policy, how we're using the agricultural policy to help farmers make this transition. Back to you. Thank you, Alice. And, and yes, you're, you're well within time. And you mentioned a key point. This is not what farmers should, but we're talking here about cooperation. I think, again, that key thread throughout all of this is the cooperation between policymakers and farmers, farmers and society, EU, Canada, et cetera. And I'll probably repeat that point as we, as we go forward, particularly like the point on enabling tools like internet access, et cetera. Um, this isn't something that, that people are necessarily going to be able to do just themselves on their own. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left within what's been nominally allocated to, to you into this slot. What, how do you think um, the EU and Canada can work best together to ensure economic and environmental sustainability in, in the sectors, given what Ad Adrian said before and what the farm to fork strategy commits us to? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, think I, I just want to make a bridge uh, or I want to make a mention of the, uh, the UN summit of next year. Uh, so I think one of the key things uh, is that, that, that the, uh, we have good outcome of this UN summit on sustainable food systems and that we have a good, I think we need to work towards a good common understanding of what, what this means. Then you're also talking about ways of measuring sustainability. Sustainability is great, but uh, you know, oftentimes we, we may mean different things. And uh, I think it's very good to listen to each other to, to try to understand what we mean and to try to come with, with me methods of, of, of measuring that. Uh, and and that, so that would be an area I think where we could, um, uh, could work together. I would also like to mention the area of research. Uh, I, I had on my on my list also the living labs as something that we have been uh, inspired. Uh, we've been inspired by the Canadian experience, and this is now also part of the uh, of the um, uh, of the, uh, the the European um, uh, Horizon Europe uh, research program that starts uh, uh, hopefully hopefully next year we still have one little budget decision to be taken but uh, uh, but I have confidence that we'll uh, will we'll achieve that so that that is a very good and important uh, um, uh, project because indeed um, we need to make sure that the research outcomes are appropriately translated to uh, uh, to to practical application and the living labs are good a very good uh, uh, inspiration in that regard. Uh, in Europe, we have already for some time um, uh, uh, innovation partnerships where we uh, put groups of farmers and researchers together. Uh, an another area of, of cooperation I think uh, that I would like to mention is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the, I think there was a, re a workshop earlier this year where uh, um, research uh, collaboration between Canada and uh, EU in this area was discussed. That the, the, the focus is on a one health approach, an approach where you look at both public and animal health together and, and try to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance. So I think this is also, or you try to reduce antimicrobial use and make sure that the resistance doesn't, uh, doesn't happen, of course. And I think this is also an area where, um, uh, where we can uh, learn. Also within the EU, we have considerable differences between member states in, in that area. So within the EU, we also learn from each other, but I think we, we should certainly expand this cooperation. There's, there's quite a bit of research cooperation with Canadian universities and, and agencies already ongoing under, under European research grants. And, and finally, maybe an area that uh, I used to work on in, a, in, a, in, one, in, a, in my earlier days of my career is uh, pulses. Uh, Canada, a big exporter of pulses, of course, a, a crop that is increasingly uh, uh, under of interest also within the EU for the reasons of soil uh, and crop uh, uh, rotation uh, challenges that we have in the EU. So also that is an area I think where where uh, we can learn specifically also to 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 try to increase yields and make this also economically an attractive crop because it has all these uh, uh, further um, uh, environmental advantages, but it also needs to be economically economically interesting. So cooperation also in the area of pulses I think is something that we could think of. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Heis. And again, perfectly on time. Um, and we will come to research a bit later on in our agenda. And Horizon Europe, as you mentioned, does have a particular mission focus on soil health and food, which I think is it picks up on points around soil carbon, etc. But also the role of soils in producing healthy and sustainable resilient food systems. Um, and just a one comment from me is on the European Innovation Partnership for Agriculture. And I'm, I'm not actually sure whether there is a link with um, with countries outside the EU, but that's an opportunity to explore that, that sort of lighthouse operational groups um, type approach to seeing, to translating research outcomes and needs on the ground to the people that will actually use them. So thank you for, for, for those interventions. Um, we, I, again, I hope to come back to you, to you both because I'm sure it would be useful for all the discussants. But I'm going to move us on now to our uh, two panelists who bring us a bit closer to those who own and manage land and importantly represent young farmers in, um, in this discussion. The first is uh, Andrea Derue from the Canadian Agricultural Youth Council. Andrea is a grain and cattle farmer and a professional agrologist in southeast Saskatchewan. Andrea, considering the importance of the agriculture sector in meeting environmental and climate objectives, how do Canadian farmers view their role in helping avoid the climate crisis going forward? I think that's particularly relevant for, um, for the youth perspective as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ben, and thank you for the organizers for uh, you know, creating, creating this event. Uh, I'd always wanted to be a part of Team Canada in the Olympics and uh, being a part of Team Canada here uh, but not to compete against, but to come together uh, and compete against some bigger challenges, I think is a fantastic opportunity and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, in regards to your question, I mean, the answer is fairly simple. Talking to farmers, you here in Canada, um, the overwhelming consensus is that agriculture is a huge opportunity to be the solution to climate change. And we're already doing so many awesome things on the farm uh, that I'll touch on later. Um, while we've had some senior individuals that have really set the pace in terms of no-till and eliminating summer follow, I think the, the general feeling is coming from a generational shift that we're starting to see at the primary producer level. Uh, the average age of our Canadian farmers is 55 years old with more Canadian farmers being over the age of 65 than under the age of 40. And um, so Canada is really about to experience this, this large shift, this large transfer of farms and farm assets to hopefully what is more, more farmers and uh, those uh, that are younger and coming in with uh, different ideas. Um, specifically, I think of my dad who left grade 10 to, to join a trade in, in uh, mechanics and then also take over the farm at such a young age with uh, helping his dad. He had given me the opportunity to go to university, obtain two degrees, um, which is something we're seeing with a lot of our farmers going to university, increasing their education, and then bringing that education back to the farm. Uh, so that right there is, is really helping um, the shift that we're starting to see at our primary producer level. Uh, also with that, we see you know, in, in my generation, the access to better technology, uh, that technology is growing at a more rapid pace than ever before. Um, and the adoption of that technology and smart technology is taking place at, at a rapid rate as well. Um, and also, I just think of the general shared information, something like this, talking to, uh, you know, hearing from Alice, a young, a young farmer from Europe, I mean, that was not very common back uh, when my dad was starting to farm. And I mean, that's all in the palm of our hand with social media, with Google, with, with all the, the access to information we have there. So uh, I think that's really driving a lot of the perception of, from our farmers and their view on how we can be a part of the solution. And uh, even our industry as a whole, our youth are becoming increasingly involved. Our Agricultural Youth Council being uh, a great part of that for Canadian egg. Uh, it's we're a group of, of a diverse group of 25 individuals across the nation in all different parts of the egg sector coming together to talk and listen. And uh, we are working with and advising 
our federal government on things that we would like to see in agriculture policy. Um, and that's, that, that's an incredible opportunity for youth and for going forward. Um, so, I mean, to, to sum it up, I mean, climate change is, is a challenge and I feel strongly that our farmers stand ready to learn, to unlearn and relearn, uh, to come up with the solutions. And at the end of the day, as long as we, we can see the environmental benefit, the societal benefit, um, as well as the economical benefit, not just for our industry, but, but for our farms, I can't be here unless if I can put food on my table. Uh, for my family. So if we, we see those three pillars uh, being a part of holding up our egg industry, uh, this is a great opportunity to have them hold up our farms as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and just to say, I, I think the average EU farmer age is around 58. So a very similar situation in, uh, in Europe as well. That generational renewal and shift at some point is going to happen. And, and it will be really interesting once that does happen. What are some of the innovative practices that are actually taking place on either on your farm or farms that you know of with respect to sustainability and climate change mitigation? And, and how widespread do you think those are? Um, I think all the sectors of our egg industry are up to the challenge and taking amazing steps. Uh, I first think of the dairy farm, their adoptions of solar and wind energy to help power their barns. I think of our cattle producers that are using rangelands effectively, sustainably, um, and the manure management uh, as well. Um, and of course, we've already touched on the no-till, the summer fallow, and there's so many other things that our grain farmers are doing in, in collaboration with all the other sectors as well. Um, I'd maybe like to just start by sharing a, a quote I heard from a fellow farmer uh, in Saskatchewan here. And he, he talked about soil health at a conference and he said, sustainable egg isn't simple and simple egg isn't sustainable. And that quote right there really drives a lot of what we're thinking about on our farm right now is uh, we have to get back to being a little complicated, uh, nature's complicated. And if we want to be working with her, our systems are gonna have to reflect some of that as well. Um, my farm ourselves, we, we are mixed grain and cattle farm in Southeast Saskatchewan. And in terms of the crops we are growing, we, we grow wheat, barley, oats, uh, canola, peas, soybeans, baba beans, uh, we've done flax. And we do all that alongside a, a commercial cow-calf herd. Uh, so about 75 cows, 75 calves. And uh, when I think of what we're doing with that, you know, we, we kind of look at our practice in two ways. First, technology. We are using data from our machines, from our crops, from imagery to help make better decisions on our farm. Um, our most recent addition has actually been a couple of weather stations and soil moisture probes. And uh, this has been really key for us because in, in dry land agriculture, water is our most limiting ingredient when growing a crop. If you can tell me how much water I have in the soil and how much is gonna fall from the sky, I can tell you how much wheat or canola or peas that I'm able to grow. And um, it's really helped us learn how to better manage water on our farm. At the end of the year, we, we want, uh, as much as that water is possible, driving, driving the yields and reducing our risk to flooding and also understanding when things are in a drier situation and where we maybe need to be a bit more conservative. Uh, and then every, being able to drive all our decisions on water are just making even more effective use of our resources. And we're able to do that through better agronomy. Uh, it has to complement technology on, on all sorts. We have to put a practical aspect to it. Um, and the four key things I think we're doing right now is we have a 4R nutrient strategy for the nutrients of our crops. So making sure we have the right nutrients in the right source at the right rate, in the right place, at the right time. Um, our livestock is absolutely key for our soil health. We are using data to identify areas of um, areas that need improvement in terms of our land base. Those areas are put down to some type of permanent cover and allows our cattle to utilize that. Uh, so increasing efficiency, reducing some waste. 
Um, we also have our very diverse grain production systems. Um, we grow, we're gonna grow six different crops this year, I believe. So we have a very strong crop rotation in place. We've also touched on intercropping on our farm, growing canola and peas together. Uh, we're looking at peas and oats to be grown together. Um, we've increased our use of some cover cropping systems. So maybe areas that do get flooded out are then put down to cover crops to keep the soil covered and in place. Um, and of course, what has already been mentioned several times is our, our no-till systems and the elimination of summer fallow uh, have been an incredible opportunity for, for us on our farm. Um, and in terms of its widespread, it, it's increasing, I think, all the time. Working as a professional agrologist with farmers of all different sizes, soil health is probably the top of mind. Uh, and these practices are, are ramping up. I think of intercropping, for example, being an opportunity um, before that guys never even thought of. And now we have enough acres here in the prairies that it's actually being covered under crop insurance now. So um, these, these practices are, are only going to gain in, in strength across the prairies here in particular. Brilliant. Thank you. And again, you're, you're putting, you're all putting a lot of pressure on the, the speakers to come because you're all sticking to time, which is, which is great from, from my perspective. Um, we talked earlier, or it was mentioned earlier, about um, living labs and lighthouse farms, and it, it sounds what you're doing is is one such example that people can learn from. Um, so it's fantastic to hear. We're going to hear now from quite a different farm in a very different part of the world. Um, our next farm representative is is Alice Saruti. Alice is head of Casina Oshina. Um, I'll have pronounced that wrong. An Italian rice farmer uh, based in the Italian uh, Piedmont region. Alice, you've represented young farmers. What do, you, what in your opinion, do young farmers bring to the pursuit of farm sustainability? And in particular, in access to latest research and innovation, sorry, is access to the latest research and innovation and technology good enough? We've just heard before that that's, that that's important in terms of taking forward the sustainability agenda. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me and for the organization of this interesting event. Um, yes, it was a pleasure for me to, to re represent young European farmers, so over 2 million of young farmers also, mm -hmm. of course, we would always like the number of young farmers to increase. Uh, as we were saying before, technology is uh, really important, really important today to, to tackle the, the, the the, the, the challenges we are living. So young farmers, of course, we are more keen to innovation. We have a wider point of view. Uh, so being young farmers today, I think is important because we are, uh, what I really learned for my, uh, for my from, from my experience of connecting with other young farmers is that it is important to understand that it, the role of farmers is really important. is important because we are the, the custodians of of the of the landscape. I think that we have uh, um, we have to have well in mind that we have to respect the environment. We have to live in synergy with the environment, and that um, it is a great opportunity if our if our product are valued correctly. If we uh, if the farmers manage to connect uh, with the chain, with the food chain, with the society and explain and have the right tools to explain to the society how we produce our food. This is a win-win situation. Uh, it was inspiring for me uh, to meet some of my, my, my university friends. They, live, uh, they work in, a, in another sector and they were telling me, do you understand that farmers are the only on, only uh, people or only workers that are price uh, takers when they ask, of course, for uh, our, our inputs, so seeds and fertilizers and tractors, but we are also price takers when we sell our, our products. When I go and sell my paddy rice, I, I ask, excuse me, milling industry, how much do you buy my rice? And talking with other young farmers, it was inspiring that we have to change this, of course, that I think that we have the right, the, we, we have the right tools and better tools are required 
to change this, to say, I am proud of how I farm. We are proud of how we farm. Um, we put all our effort in farming in a safer way, in, a, in producing better products, healthier products, uh, looking at biodiversity, uh, um, increasing the quality of our soils. And we have to explain it to the society along the food chain so that the, our products are valued correctly. And as I was saying, it can really become a win-win situation. So as, as young farmers, what we really um, wanted is to have a stronger voice uh, uh, young farmers are available, are wanting, and, and it is inspiring also the, the Canadian experience of how, um, how farmers are not only farmers anymore. It's not that we are only, a, uh, we are only able to um, work on our tractors or we want only to work on our tractors. Of course, farming is our priority because we live of this, but we are willing to exchange our knowledge, our experience, uh, with stakeholders, decision makers, to make a better farming sector and environment possible. And so this, as, as, as young farmers, was, was really important for us. Yeah, thank you, Alice. I'm going to go slightly off, off the questions that we've, we've discussed with you before, and because I think you raise a really important point about that, uh, well, actually it's been raised before, about that connection with consumers. How do you think that can be made better from, from your from your perspective, how how and what would you need as a young farmer to make that connection with consumers where you can say, I am doing these sustainability things, value my product for that? Well, first of all, a better labeling system, so more transparency in the label origin, because you know the quality of of a farming product, the quality of the plate is not only what is in the plate. It, it, what is in your food, it's not the food is good. No, the quality is also how it is produced. So the, so the, the history, what came before. So we would need more efficient labeling system because labeling is the only, the, it's not the only, but it, it is the, the tool, the immediate tool that we have with consumers. So with a better labeling system, uh, uh, it could be easier. So origin, uh, production methods, and other other important uh, informations for consumers again, so that it can be a win-win situation. And then I think um, increasing, as as we were saying before, um, increasing platforms. I don't I don't actually know how, but if 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 there would be more best practices platforms, best practices connections uh, projects where we can exchange with other farmers, uh, our, our best management practices, but also with, with consumers. For example, on our farm, biodiversity is one of our priority. We just had, after four years of planning, um, we just con converted one fourth of our rice farming land in natural reserve for natural wetland, for biodiversity, for the nesting of the birds, for butterflies and, and, and dragonflies and biodiversity. In general, we, we are implementing tourism and, and transparency. So I think that what would be needed also is um, tools to, um, to allow us to um, achieve, to, uh, I don't know how, how I can say, to shorten to shorten the distance between farmers and consumers and civil society, uh, especially when, as young farmers, we are we we are keen to to transparency because we are proud of how we farm. So we always say our gates are always open. Come and see how we farm. So um, if food food, I th that's what I would say uh, to to sum up: food labeling first of all, and then tools to um, shorten the distances between farmers and civil society. Brilliant, thank you, Alice. And within one minute, Andrea, can I come back to you and just get your reflections on what, how you think that you could make that better connection with consumers? Do you have any thoughts on that? So just within one minute. Yeah, if I could have a, a camera crew follow me around and just have live video of on-farm activity to show what we're actually doing, 
that'd be awesome. But um, from from my sense, I, it's it's hard to put that more work on farmers. I connect on on Twitter and on Facebook, on Instagram, um, and I just share. I just share, share, share. Um, you know, you can't be afraid to, to hide from the, some of the tougher questions and stuff too. Uh, have open and honest dis discussions and recognize when there's someone there who, who's maybe not even willing to listen, when, when to engage and when not to, to engage there. Um, and then I, I really think it, the responsibility falls on our whole industry. It's not just the farmer level. We need our public and private researchers. We need our government. We, we need everyone sharing all these good stories out there. And uh, over time, that connection and that trust will just build. Brilliant. Thank you. And if, if you're not already connected, I, I would hope that we can connect uh, these two young farmers together just to share experiences as well through this platform. So, so thank you both for that. Thank you, Alice, for, for your thoughts. Um, again, we may come back to you on, on particular points. Um, we now move to our research part of our panel. Um, we're bringing in that focus on research. It's already been mentioned now in, I think, every intervention we've heard so far, so no pressure. Um, we have now Dr. Mario Tenuta, who's Professor of Soil Ecology at the University of Manitoba. And again, soil was another key theme that's, that's come up in these discussions. Mario, you're, you're passionate about some of the good farming practices taking place in Canada that ensure, ensure soil health and mitigate climate change impacts. Can you outline some of the good soil practices that are going on um, in Canada and what's unique about the Canadian example that, that we can learn from in the EU? Thank you, Ben. Um, so in the brief time, I'll, I'll um, try to um, be very concise here. So in terms of the good soil management practices, um, our uh, prairie farmers, which is the bulk of our export grain products um, to the world, um, have uh, undergone quite a few changes um, over the past um, couple of decades. One of them is uh, direct seeding or uh, one pass operation. So this is where uh, seeding, fertilizing, um, herbicide application uh, are done uh, at one time, or can be done at one time. And uh, this has just come out of necessity uh, from our uh, uh, farmers to, uh, because we have large fields here, and to limit the costs of uh, planting a crop and managing a crop, they've kind of economized. And this direct seeding though has a, a great impact in that that has resulted in reduction in tillage. So not tilling the fields. And so this uh, over the past uh, a couple of decades has really become the dominant way of producing crops on our prairies, except in the areas where we have clay soils. The other soils are very much amenable to this approach. And this lack of tillage has really increased uh, the protection of soil organic matter, the physical protection of soil organic matter, and has resulted in increases in uh, soil organic matter levels. Um, it's not the only reason for an increase. The other reason for an increase in our soil organic matter levels over the prairies, and this is a massive area, I'm not sure you, exactly, uh, you know, it would probably be Italy and France and another country, uh, put together, let's put Liechtenstein and Luxembourg in there too, okay? Uh, um, and that is an increase in our diversity of crops. And you heard that from Andrea. Like, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that the diversity of crops on the prairies is probably the greatest in the world in terms of what our farmers are producing, an individual farmer. And we're not talking little fields here, we're talking big fields. And the increased diversity is, has occurred because of the introduction of pulses. So we heard about pulses and Canada is a leading exporter in pulse crops like uh, lentils, chickpeas, peas, and um, uh, dry edible beans. And the pulses have allowed us to uh, grow uh, a crop in our semi-arid uh, environments. Whereas before we used to do or practice fallow to conserve soil moisture where we wouldn't grow a crop in a year. But now with the advent of uh, introduction of pulses, they're able to, farmers are able to, to 
grow a crop as well. And so uh, this has provided carbon, whereas in for decades previously, you know, the, our, our, those fields would have been starved for carbon in the fallow years. So th this is really dramatic, a change in our, in our carbon sequestration uh, and increased rates. Another is on our clay soils, we've reduced burning of crop residues. We have improved residue management in terms of um, how to seed and plant into residues and how to just do a light incorporation of those residues into the soils without heavy tillage. And another aspect in terms of what our uh, farmers are doing, and, and Andrea mentioned this as well, something very close to dear to my heart is, is, is better nutrient management practices, particularly with the four R's. So this is a, is a framework for nutrient stewardship that really Canada has been a leader in and um, farmers, industry and researchers have been involved with. And our farmers actually do a great, great job in uh, practicing um, uh, environmentally friendly uh, nitrogen use. So we do subsurface banding of nitrogen, which is very common, which is tied in with our direct seeding one pass operations, getting the nitrogen away from the surface of the soil into bands. And there's lots of benefits of those bands in terms of improving the efficiency of the nitrogen uh, transfer to the crops and, in, and also uh, phosphorus when, uh, because it is also banded or seed row applied and kept away from the surface. So uh, those are my, my four major points in terms of what, uh, um, what farmers have been doing. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Maria. Sorry, I was, I was too intent on listening. I forgot I was actually supposed to be chairing. Um, <laughs> no, that, that is really interesting. And I think that, that better nutrient management practices is, um, um, I forget the exact wording of it. I know high school know, but the, uh, the nutrient management planning in the future CAP will be a key tool and it's a key focus, particularly around things like phosphorus, which are um, finite in terms of our resources of them. Where do you think there may be room for, I, I hesitate to ask this given the sheer scale of Canada again, there may be room for Canada's agriculture sector to scale up in terms of good soil management practices. You talked about prairies being pretty ex extensive. Um, yeah, do you have broader thoughts on that? Yes, well, there's, there's always opportunities in agriculture, right? Uh, farming and production is ever evolving. It's never stagnant. And always changing, so it, it's changing, and especially with a generational change uh, with younger farmers coming on board, you're going to see this really accelerate. I think. So um, some points about that: uh, cover cropping and polycropping are an area that uh, farmers are uh, trying out. Some have embraced, and they I uh, see this as a major, major area of um, innovation and growth and adoption in Canada. So, um, so we have uh, basically, you call it conservation agriculture and then term now is regenerative agriculture. A lot of the practices involved in those frameworks for producing agriculture are coming on as being mainstream, being adopted by what you, you know, maybe we call it conventional farmers or farming. So practices like cover cropping and polycultures are, are being tested. Um, my farmers are trying it, they're testing it, they see advantages um, in many ways in terms of particularly because of soil health improvements. So I see, I see that as, as a major growth area. Uh, the second is um, for the prairies is our ability to manage our clay soils is going to be getting better. I think the the technology related with our implements, our seeding implements and planters are, is improving. And, uh, and I, I really see this as really in the next 10 years, we're really gonna flourish and our clay soils are gonna catch up with the rest of the prairies. So the clay soils, you know, make up a bit of the prairies, um, not, let's say 10%, maybe five, 10%, but, uh, um, they, they will catch up as well, I think. Another uh, aspect is that our uh, farmers on the prairies, these farms are large and many farms have consultants 
agricultural consultants that are trained and have accreditation to advise farmers. So we have uh, experts working with farmers, developing nutrient management plans, cropping plants, pesticide use plans, you name it. And so this is a, a great opportunity for scaling because we have a network already in place to interface between researchers, policymakers, with farmers, through extension agents, government extension agents, but also this private sector um, a group that farmers trust and, and also look to. Not that they don't trust me or government, <laughs> uh, but uh, so it, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for scaling because that's, that's their job actually is, is to assist that way. And we know we heard about uh, precision agriculture. This is only gonna take off more. We have large fields, they're relatively flat, and, and our farmers have embraced um, auto steer uh, and, and precision agriculture um, um, uh, format and technologies. This is only going to be improved. We see this. This is a huge growth area, and particularly industry is, is jumping in here and, and leading the charge. And I think related with that is going to be controlled traffic, which, which is a, a means for uh, using tram lines and um, using having wheel traffic over the same area in your fields for all operations in terms of planting, harvesting, and if there was any in-season spraying and things like that. And I see that as a massive, going to really improve our soil health, particularly in our no-tillage uh, systems. And um, you know, my list, my list keeps going on. Uh, uh, carbon markets. Uh, we've seen in Canada now, really, I think we have good inertia to, to a national carbon market system, which I think goes hand in hand with the federal government uh, uh, direction and goals. And industry is looking, now here I'm talking about, or let's say the uh, fossil fuel industry and, or manufacturing industries are looking for opportunities for credits. And so agriculture, provides that opportunity for credits, particularly through carbon sequestration and nitrous oxide emission reductions. And, and so I see that that as soon as that happens, now farmers uh, not only have a, a, a benefit that they see in their soil and their production and their input uh, uh, cost reductions by these practices, but also get a monetary return for them as well. So I think that's only gonna accelerate things. I'm looking, so I'm really looking forward to that. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, plant-based protein. So really on the prairies, it's, you know, Roquette has, has a massive uh, pea protein plant that just established uh, half an hour away from me where I live. We have other plants um, in my city being formed right now. And uh, we, we see a, uh, uh, an interest by consumers for plant-based protein products meat simulants, if you want to call it, plant-based meats. And uh, Canada is, and the prairies are well suited because we are a leading uh, pulse uh, production um, uh, country. I'm and, gonna, I'm gonna pause you there just so we can we can bring in on our speaker, but but thank you. I, I, I'm glad we got to the last item on, on your list. Uh, and you did touch there on two things which are well, particularly live discussions in the EU carbon markets being one. Um, there is the development of an EU carbon farming initiative that's that's one of the actions of the farm to fork strategy. So that's perhaps an area for, for collaboration and learning um, between EU and Canada. And, and the protein transition uh, is essential. And that's actually a nice segue perhaps to, to our final speaker. Um, and thank you, Mario, for your inputs there. Our final speaker today is Nick Jacobs. Uh, Nick is the director of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IFES Food, and is an expert in agri-food agri trade and development policy. Um, Nick, the reason I say segue is because I know a number of researchers working around protein transition and agroecology and the links between them. I won't ask you that link specifically, but We've heard a lot about different terminology used, or at least I've picked up on different terminology that I'm used to hearing in an EU debate. The term agroecology is, is used a lot, particularly in Europe. I don't know if it's used particularly widespreadly in, in Canada. Um, participants can, can nod or shake their heads to confirm that. 
Um, but what is it? Um, how, is, how applicable is it to the challenges facing the EU through the farm to fork strategy, things that we've heard already, and Canadian farms as well? Um, and I don't want to dwell on the scale point, but, but that's perhaps something to reflect on as well there. And in producing enough to ensure food security and addressing carbon sequestration. Nick. Uh, thanks very much, Ben, and thanks everybody for the great um, presentation so far. So to come to the first part of the question, what is agroecology? Uh, this is essentially an umbrella term covering a whole variety of different approaches to sustainable agriculture. Um, but the thing that these approaches have in common is that they're really looking at the agroecosystem holistically and looking at ways to redesign and reorganize it on a fundamental level and in a way that will be recycling the resources and the biomass that's available on the farm and develop, developing as many natural synergies as possible between the different elements of the farm. Um, so whether people describe that um, or describe themselves as regenerative farmers, biodynamic, permacultural, or even organic in some cases, um, there's often this common thread of, of an element of kind of redesigning the system to try to build these synergies and to move away from reliance on chemical inputs. Um, so in, in concrete terms, this means polycultures, uh, mixed crop livestock systems, particularly where the feed is produced on farm for the livestock um, and agroforestry systems, where you also have synergies between those two components. Um, so these are systems with kind of diversity and circularity at all levels. Th those are the fundamental principles here. And, you know, in reality, most farmers are probably somewhere on the spectrum between highly specialized input intensive industrial units and highly diversified agroecological systems. And, you know, a lot of the examples we've heard today would, would suggest that um, a lot of farmers are really moving towards that, that more diversified model and particularly looking at soil health as a key challenge and, and making sure um, they're doing as much as possible to, to redesign the agroecosystem in a way that protects soil health and, and therefore protects productivity in the longer term. Um, I, I would add also that, you know, agroecology, and this is perhaps where it differs from some other approaches, there does tend to be um, elements of, of redesign beyond the farm level. And agroecology is often rooted in um, a set of principles to do with different relationships between farmers and buyers, often linked to shorter supply chains um, where farmers have a diversity of produce and, and, for example, in the community supported agriculture model will be setting prices themselves to pick up on, on the point about being price takers and, and therefore kind of creating really a, a different relationship between the farmer and, and the rest of the food system. There's also tend to be different approaches to knowledge um, much less linear, much more based on horizontal peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And again, something we've, we've already heard about today, it's moving fast. Um, then coming to the second part of Ben's question, you know, why is this relevant to the EU and, and Canada and the challenges we're facing? Um, first of all, it's, it's worth noting that agroecology is often seen as something that's just relevant to, you know, small-scale farms in the global south. And you, you see some EU member states who are kind of prioritizing agroecology now within their development policies, but are not um, promoting it to the same extent in their domestic agriculture policies. Um, but if you look at the evidence, you know, it really, really does provide answers to a lot of the challenges that we're facing um, in the global north as well, and including food security. Um, so, so first of all, you know, why is it relevant? Well, agroecology can reconcile the, the whole range of environmental challenges that we're facing, and they're really vast. I think if we look at the way our current food systems are evolving on both sides of the Atlantic, um, there have been some notable achievements. There's generally high productivity reconciled with um, a degree of climate mitigation. We've, we've heard about progress on, on soil erosion and soil health, um, but you know, the challenges are vast and there are still plenty of trade-offs. And we do see the kind of intensive, highly specialized systems are continuing to generate you know, massive externalities, still driving uh, biodiversity loss, uh, nitrate pollution from overuse of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, um, endocrine disruptors entering the food system um, and, and with, with huge uh, human health and financial costs. And you know, biodiversity is one just to highlight um, the data is alarming here. We have 75% loss of insect biomass observed in protected areas in Germany over 30 years. So this is, a, you know, these are huge challenges. And 
these these challenges are coming home to roost in terms of the productivity of our systems. Um, a, a recent meta study found that actually a lot of the more, only just more than half of wheat production areas globally are still seeing productivity increases. So otherwise they're stagnating, collapsing, and, and often that's because of poor soil management and, and failure to take these things into account. So, the, you know, agroecology does put the health of the agro ecosystem first. That's the first building block and, um, and puts the, the health of the soil first and the ability to stop carbon. So, so with an agroecological approach, you do see the different challenges being reconciled, also the socioeconomic challenges, trying to develop a different livelihood model for farmers. So they're not reliant on um, relationships with, with big buyers who, who are able to set the conditions and set the prices. Um, agroecology you know, is relevant as well because it can deliver economic benefits and, and secure livelihoods to, to go a bit further on that line. Um, there are some yield differences for sure if, if you're going towards an agroecological model that's more extensive, more diversified. Some of the um, direct comparisons in terms of crop yields show um, slight reductions uh, on, for example, organic fields compared to conventional. Um, but the data is also showing that agroecology is able to deliver cost savings, resource efficiencies, and therefore higher income for farmers who are making this shift in terms of the, the income per unit of production. And um, a recent study by Jan Del van der Plog in the Netherlands with, with researchers from, from across Europe looking at around 10 different countries showed that there are income benefits for, in general for farmers shifting to agroecology, notably in the dairy sector and, and notably when farmers are able to kind of uh, really redesign the production system, integrate feed production on farm and do many of the things that we've already been hearing about. Um, another reason that agroecology can deliver these economic benefits is because of its resilience to shocks. And that's something we haven't talked about that much today, but, but surely this is going to be a huge issue in the future. There are going to be more climate shocks, more disease disruptions, uh, and the economic disruption that comes with these things. And agroecology and farming systems in general that are based around principles of diversity and circularity, um, they're well placed because of that diversity. They're well placed to be resilient to shocks and they're less reliant on the long distance supply chains, whether it's for the inputs they require, whether the, the markets for selling or even um, bringing in seasonal laborers. We've seen in the COVID crisis that these things are highly vulnerable. And some, you know, the evidence is still coming together, but it seems that the shorter supply chain models in Europe have, have fed fairly well through the crisis and are seeing increased demand and managing to, to respond to it. Um, I would, sorry, Ben, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm just conscious of time, but I, I just wanted to get your reflections on um, the role of the role of technology. So we heard from um, uh, from from Mario the the sort of more technological focus shifts within Canadian agriculture, and I don't think agriculture is is technology immune. It's um, there will be a role for technology in this process, and and can you give a reflection on that whilst you have the floor? Sure, it's unfortunately often characterized as being very hostile to technologies. What I would say is that I think people within the agroecological agri movement really see social innovation and technological innovation as going hand in hand. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's the way farmers are organized um, between themselves, for example, in cooperatives that, that are seen as bringing the, the greatest benefits and, and addressing the biggest challenges um, in terms of you know, the, the price and the, the value they're getting currently for their production. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, I, agroecology and the type of diversification we're talking about is fundamentally compatible with a lot of the technological breakthroughs we're seeing in agriculture. Um, in some cases, um, some technologies will not be appropriate for farmers working at a particular scale, and, and there's certainly a risk of greater indebtedness and, and path dependencies. And, you know, for example, if you imagine a drone that's designed really to, to increase the productivity of a specific crop. Once you've invested in that, whether you have a, a degree of diversity to start with, you may face price, you know, economic constraints that bring you back into a monoculture model. Um, so you can get the most out of that technology. So um, at that point, <laughs> the technology is, you know, there for its own sake, and it's not really supporting the, the general direction of travel that we need towards a more diverse system. 
but it's certainly going to be interesting to see how those technologies um, can can be um, adopted within that model. And the test is really whether they do support that journey towards um, more resilience and more diversification, or whether they kind of keep farmers locked into a more uh, monoculture-based system. Brilliant, thank you. So I think it was and Andrea or Alice who mentioned about a form of remote sensing about monitoring sort of soil moisture and, and water levels and so on, which which I would imagine is still crucially important for agroecological techniques, even though there's that, that closer link with, with natural cycles. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting close to time. Um, this is the bit where, where I get to speak. I don't think people necessarily want to hear that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try and wrap everything up, but I'll use this time to just give a quick lightning round to, to everyone on the panel. And in one or two words, um, what's one issue that the EU and Canada could usefully cooperate on to support low carbon sustainable farming? So I'll go through this. I'll go through this randomly, and I'll go first to to Andrian, just because also you've been fielding a lot of the questions that have come through the chat, as has as has Heist. So thank you very much for that and for engaging with our audience there. But one issue EU and Canada could usefully cooperate on and support low carbon sustainable farming. Well, I think, as I mentioned, definitely sharing of experiences and approaches. It's it's just too bad that, you know, there were so many interesting uh, comments and mentions made that I would have really liked to uh, to respond to in the in the panel. So thank you for organizing a great panel. But uh, yeah, I think definitely sharing of information, uh, lessons learned in terms of uh, approaches with farmers, because as I said, we have so much in common in terms of long term interest, looking at I'm sorry, that was my cat. Um, Long-term interests uh, in terms of conserving resources, reducing GHG emissions, and then supporting also the sector. I think the the comments by Alice and Andrea were very, very convincing from that perspective. You know, we need to think to take into account that sustainability also includes economic sustainability, and keep that in mind because otherwise, you know, we won't have the the the, the, the you know we won't have the, the the possibility to have the, the the farmers there anymore or not the way we have them right now so um so i think those approaches where we work for, with, with farmers we listen to what it means for them and we keep in, we, we take into account the 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 whole system of uh, you know i re i was really interested by the discussion on on agroecology with my it, i did my phd in germany and then you know we were looking at the spreewald system so you know where you have actual agricultural production in a biosphere reserve so i think this is this would be great to know much more about that to learn about those different initiatives and then and then i know there's also rice production in uh, in La Camargue in France, you know, where we're looking at those initiatives for, for us, it would be really interesting to learn more about those very, very closely, uh, close relationships between nature conservation and agriculture. Of course, it's a completely different story in Canada, but I think learning about those experiences is uh, is great for on both sides. And then at the same time, we can also share a lot about the, 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 the technologies and the science and also the approaches that we're trying to establish with, the, with producers to, to try to advance sustainability. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And, and my apology is that we haven't had more of an opportunity to have this, this, this two-way engagement. I think we could have spent a day or two days doing this, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to get together and do that. Um, Alice, what's your one, two points on key issues EU and Canada could usefully cooperate on from your perspective? Yeah, thanks. I, I would definitely say uh, sh sharing best practices, of course, but also uh, it was very interesting, the agro uh, ecology um, points and um, because how how it is possible that a multifunctional approach that, that a diversified income diversified crops diversified approach diversified um, customers and diversified uh, mentality can really increase resilience all all across our farms and of course across the countries. Brilliant, thank you, Alice. Um, Mario. Yes, so um, I think things from my perspective that would be very helpful would be uh, um, coordination on carbon markets. I know it sounds very bureaucratical and things like that, but it does have a very big impact on the farm and in management, and particularly carbon markets related with nitrous oxide reductions and through practices for nitrous oxide reduction and also for carbon sequestration and carbon building. If we had some harmony there and we could expand the, the industry 
industries and the farmers and the land base that can be together in a joint carbon market, I think that gives us both a lot of opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, hi. Yes, thanks, Ben. Um, uh, this has been extremely inspiring uh, uh, a way to spend my afternoon. Uh, I, I wrote down uh, when you asked your question, soil health. And I think I'm, I'm pretty close to what Mario has in mind. That's the, the area of, um, uh, of, of, of cropping systems to maintain soil health, but there's linkages throughout the system through carbon, uh, through, through carbon uh, capture, carbon markets, which indeed is a, is a very big issue uh, for us to reach our uh, 2050 neutrality uh, objective and even 2035 uh, uh, neutrality in terms of land use and, and agriculture. So, uh, so indeed, we need to um, we need to work on that. And I I, I see uh, I've been writing nonstop. I see a lot of a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for for cooperation. So so really uh, really quite in, in inspiring. And I was thinking also all the time about the diversity of agriculture. You know, in in Europe, we always think about agriculture as being diverse. And I was thinking, wh what is my own um, experience of Canadian agriculture? It's uh, I've been on the prairies, but I actually worked on a raspberry picking machine in British Columbia in in, in a long past so um so also i think canada has also this diversity that that uh, that can be inspiring for us thanks brilliant thank you host nick um i think that the eu and canada could really usefully cooperate on the rollout of the farm to fork strategy and the canadian food policy i think these are these are hugely promising um making a difference on carbon in agriculture relies on having joined up actions all across the chain. It's not just the responsibility of farmers. We need a diet shift. We need a change in research and innovation and farm advisory services. And the only way to do that is to have an integrated food policy approach. And, and we've got the seeds of that now in, in both regions. And it would be great to see um, kind of a shared commitment to having a really high ambition as, as we roll those out. Brilliant, thank you, Nick. And finally, Andrea. I don't know if there's a whole much more I can add. I agree with everything that has really been mentioned. Um, I think a, a key part for me, if, I, if I'm being a little selfish of what I can take back to the farm is uh, that connection to farmers in, in Europe and uh, having that flow of shared information, shared experience, shared research. And then uh, the policies, I think, you know, there's some commonality between the two that we can work on together and uh, build a, a system that you know supports our farmers and only gets better as we we build up brilliant thank you andrea and thank you so much to our panelists we we have finished on time you all kept to schedule my job has been incredibly easy your interventions were were excellent um one of my challenges is trying to make my own notes my own interest whilst listening to you and, and and uh, asking the questions. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to our organizers, um, to the team here at IEP, to the Canadian Mission to the EU for making this possible. It is very welcome. And thank you so much to the participants. I now see them starting to drop off the call as I wrap up. Um, but for those that weren't watching, we had up to around 150 people listening in, I think uh, at one point, just, just below that. So thank you so much for listening to this. I hope it's been inspiring. Um, this will be this is recorded we will put this link up on our website and we will circulate that link to everyone um, and i hope we can keep this collaboration going and the exchange going um, between the eu and canada going forwards whether that's at the policy level it's at the research level or it's farmers connecting and understanding how each other works in that context so thank you very much for that um, it is now dark outside here in the uk signaling the almost the end of the working day i know it's still morning over there in in Canada. So I wish you a very pleasant day or evening and we'll close there. Thank you.